Welcome to Sci-Fi Steve's Museum of Circa 1950 Spaceships. Today's tour was inspired by the television series of the 1960s, Lost in Space. Now, <clears throat> if you listen to the intro at all, you'll know that this is Steve's Sci-Fi 1950s. This is 1960. How did I get here? Just real quick, I was doing a project with another fella. Uh, he and I had emailed back and forth a lot, and we thought we could do um, justice to this particular thing show, which we both were crazy about, but as time went on, we realized that we weren't going to be able to do this together, and we sort of dropped it at that. I had so much footage, and I'd done so much research on um, cryogenics and other things that um, I wanted to finish this up. This is something I just wanted to do. I love the series. Uh, Guy Williams is one of my favorite actors from that time period. In fact, my son's name is Guy Williams, my last name, because um, I really like the show. Okay, and so I thought I would put this together uh, under my theme of how to do it. Here is the prototype, the Gemini 12. This is for the uh, pilot series. Uh, this ship measures just under 50 feet across and just under uh, 15 feet in total height, including the engine. In the 1960s, Lost in Space came up with a very unique idea of how to get to another star. Since nobody had any idea how to get up to light speed, they went to the science of cryogenics and they said, let's, fear, let's freeze the crew, get the ship up to as much speed as we possibly can, grind out the distance while the crew is frozen, and then when we get to the other end, defrost the crew and uh, colonize another world. This little ship provided us with all of that. Now as the seasons moved on, this is what the saucer eventually looked like. And you can see it got a great deal larger. And is far more representative of the saucer as it needed to be. To hold such things as the, um, the chariot and the lander, or explorer as he sometimes called it. Uh, there was the deep space probe, all those kind of things a larger space for the engine. Um, it did a lot to answer questions about what went where and why. Um, but it, as you clearly see, it kept the same shape. Um, the flight deck uh, moves up about 18 inches, 2 feet from the center seam there, um, the evenly dividing the ship up so that you have the flight deck, engineering, and then on the lower deck you have the living space, galley, things like that. We're going to set up a mission statement here, and the mission statement is going to describe the goals of what we want to do and a time period so that it has a limitation of what we can do. Okay, uh, first, we want to design our ship after the series Lost in Space back in 1965. We want to send three couples, right? We want to use uh, cryogenics as a means to get them there. Um, we'll be going less than the speed of light. From what I've looked at, we can find Earth-type planets between 25 and 40 light years out from our star. Unfortunately, the most exact Earth-type planet is over 450 years away. That's outrageous. We can't do that. Okay, uh, we're going to take present-day technologies. We're going to extend them out to 30, 35 years to do this and see what we come up with. Here's the proposed ship in flight. The ship is just under 100 feet in diameter, just under 40 feet thick. The ship is divided into three levels. The upper level, uh, the, which I call the flight deck, which is where the uh, freezer tubes are and the pilot uh, sits. The lower level is the uh, living quarters, uh, bedrooms, galley, uh, hospital. The lower level is the magnetic drive, uh, which will give the ship its propulsion. Next, what is the power for the ship? There are three items. You have nuclear, fusion, antimatter. Nuclear won't cut it. A nuclear reactor is only good for five years. Sounds great going around the planet. Getting to another star is a different matter. you got to last way past five years. Because after you land, you have to continue to provide power for your passengers. Plus, of course, you want to throw them back into the Stone Age. Antimatter. Antimatter is just too hard to make. 
it's also limited in the supplies that you can take on board our saucer. Our saucer is only so big, right? So whatever fuel you leave with is the fuel you got to have on the other end to continue, right? Bringing along cyclotrons and things like that to make more fuel, be it nuclear or be it any matter, just not practical. That leaves us with fusion. Fusion requires a container to do the fusion in, lasers to reach the temperature to start fusion, and a water container. 18 ounces of water will supply, theoretically, Los Angeles with all the power it needs for a year. You get to the other end, you put more water in the container, and you're off and running. We're going with fusion. To shorten up the tour, we're going to take a look at a couple of rooms here on the flight deck that are just not that interesting to go see. And we're going to look at them from above. I'm going to show you that they're there. They are pertinent to the ship, but they're just not that interesting. First room we're going to look at is the computer room. The computer monitors all activity on board the ship, including the astronauts themselves. Right behind the computer, you'll see part of the chiller units for the hibernation tubes. And they're set behind each one. Each one is independent. Next is the uh, air ventilation sy system and the water scrubbers uh, necessary for the ship. Not very interesting to look at. Next is the storage compartment for the raw materials that goes into the 3D replicator. Last room on the flight deck is the air and water uh, auxiliary supplies in case something goes wrong. You can flush any of the systems and refill them with these tanks. Okay, this is the same sort of thing on the living deck. It is basically the sleeping quarters or suites for the three sets of adults, right? Um, they're beds, cabinets, washers. Um, they're all really there. I'm not taking any kids. If you want kids, it's a lot of fun to make brand new ones at the other end. Okay, let's start our tour with the uh, walkthrough by entering via the airlock on the left side. Pushing the buttons will get us out of the airlock and onto the flight deck. The first device that we're looking at here is part of the uh, interstellar navigation system and it gives a physical relationship between the saucer and in this case the three pulsars that we're tracking. Right As we turn here you can see the interstellar navigation equipment. It is designed to find and locate uh, a category of pulsar can be determined by its rate of blinking. All pulsars blink at different rates. The first thing it does is it locks on the Sol on departure. Next, it has to locate at least three pulsars to identify where it is in three-dimensional space. It is capable of tracking as many as ten pulsars at any one time. So the top entry has Sol and then the other entries following underneath that give the angle from Sol so that you can locate exactly where you are. Where did I get this? The South Voyager spacecraft does it. If it's good enough for NASA to pilot ourselves out of our solar system, it's good enough for me. And with all of this technical equipment, how do you possibly get lost? All you have to do is lose Sol. If you can't find Sol, you're lost in space. Just to the left of this, we have the airlock, the EVA dressing area, the EVA locker for all the equipment that will be necessary to take a spacewalk. This is the EVA console. It's used to monitor the activity outside the ship. This would include astronauts, the pod, and the tractor. It can be used to take control of the pod or the tractor and bring them back to the ship if necessary. This is the actual bridge of the ship and this is where the pilot does his piloting thing and stuff like that. But what we're looking at right here is access to the main computer. Now the main computer is always running a series of programs to keep the ship uh, in flight or even just resting on the ground, engines off. He's always doing something. If you need to monitor anything on board the ship, it is done here. You can bring up detailed schematics, engineering plans, things like that. You can take all the measurements and extreme locations. In some cases, you can make modifications to those circuits in flight, but that's what the computer does for you. This is the pilot and co-pilot station. From here, they fly the ship. 
in a standard and conventional manner. That is, they fly it like a, a jet aircraft or a space shuttle or something like that. Um, this is all sub-light speed stuff, probably 100,000 miles an hour or less. Uh, from here, they'll take the ship into orbit around a planet. Uh, they'll search the planet, possibly deploy the uh, pod, uh, determine the best possible location. The station on the left on the pilot deck here is the uh, controls for the power and propulsion of the ship. The upper display show the various locations and their statuses, and they operate in a simple green, yellow, red. There are small dials, minor adjustments can be made to the overall system if you need to push them high or low. On the bottom are the controls for those systems. The first system on the left is for the fusion reactor. What you're looking at there are the gates which I consider to be critical to the operation of the fusion reactor. Any one gate is red, you're not flying. Right, so all the gates must be green all the time to make the thing go. Center panel is for the routing of the power that comes off the fusion reactor. It's laid out on the left with the fusion reactor. That heat is then transferred to the three thermo generators. No moving parts. They convert heat directly to electricity. Then you have the routing of the power to the various engines. You have the conventional engines and you have the hyper engines. On the right are the controls used to describe and alter the magnetic field around the ship so that you can do the operations of flight that you need. The freezer tubes. The freezer tubes are critical to the genre period that this went on. I mean, the whole story is based that you can freeze a human body, take whatever time's needed to get to where you want to go, and then revive them. Okay, in my research, I found that the University of Pittsburgh and a clinic in Boston are, in the, are currently in the process of taking dogs and cats, lowering their body temperatures down to 10 degrees centigrade, performing very critical surgeries on these animals, and then reviving them. They have an 80% revival rate right now. Now remember, this, we're going to do this 30 years from now, so, you know, <laughs> hopefully they'll up it a little bit. Now from what I read, the freezing process procedure is very complex. That is, this is not step into the clear plastic tube, somebody goes over and throws a switch and you become inanimate. No, the body is slowly lowered in temperature. Unique chemicals are added to the body, specifically into the brain and the eyes, to prevent crystallization and to prevent uh, oxygen deprecation as the body temperature is dropping. Remember, the, the brain is still cooking. He wants to keep going, and all of a sudden, you know, the blood flow is cutting off. He can't tell that you're not being strangled. Okay, so the body temperature is dropped. This procedure is very complex, and I can't see it being done any other place except on a in the hospital. When the procedure is done at the hospital, our crew members will be in these steel canisters. When they have reached an optimum level, the canister will be sealed. It will be brought into the ship and hooked up to these maintenance units. This is very critical to the ship at this time. This is a one-way trip. You can go there and take the 40 years, but nobody can, you can be defrosted, and they cannot re- freeze you and bring you back because the science isn't at that end, right? You can't bring all that equipment and all those technical people to make this happen. The defrost uh, procedure is much simpler and when you get to the other end, I assume that you're still going to be in deep space. They'll gradually be warm, the blood circulation will get going. Uh, when you're at the correct levels, the canister will open up and uh, you'll start walking around again. Okay, we're going to move on over to the uh, pod launch bay. Now, the pod launch bay, bay uh, would represent an excursion craft, uh, a machine that's basically designed to carry a man, and you go out and you do some long-distance exploring and then return, and that's what this whole area is now dedicated to. Now, as you walk in, the first device you see is basically the uh, pre-launch controls. This makes sure that the craft is already ready to go, um, this thing is basically uh, battery-operated. Uh, 
carries a nice charge. It's magnetically driven, just like the ship itself. It's not going to obtain any real high speeds, but it is capable of landing and taking off from a 1G planet several times in its excursion. It can fly in the atmosphere uh, every bit as well as it can outside of the atmosphere. Uh, the ladder you see goes up into the craft that closes as part of the airlock system. As we rotate around, you'll see the black containers in the background. That's just you can't have any wasted space. Those are just storage containers that contain all kinds of things, right? As we pan around a little bit further, the canisters you see along the wall they're strapped, the silver ones, those are the batteries for the pod. They're also the batteries for the uh, chariot. They're all the same. Uh, over to the left, you'll take a look. There's, there's uh, some reaction chemicals. The reaction chemicals are used for uh, gyro motions of the uh, pod and its rotation back and forth, left to right, just like a conventional craft. Let's close the pod door, secure the airlock, and step outside to watch the launch. We're outside the saucer right now. The hatch will open. The electric elevator will bring this pod up to the top and then the pilot will fly away. No flying from inside the saucer. That's reserved for James Bond. Now we agreed that we would be going with Fusion to drive the ship and as we go through the door here, here is the container as it's being designed right now for public use in Europe with a group of countries which includes America. Okay, um, the water is injected in here, the laser is fired off, the plasma ring is created within here. The actual container is sort of donut shaped only elongated. Um, and that's it. And we have the water so we can um, refuel later on with no complicated equipment. But time marches on. On October 30th, 2014, uh, Lockheed Skunk Works announced that they have come up with a very small fusion reactor. They haven't even built it yet, but they feel very confident that they announced that it probably will be available in five years, production in ten. Now the only thing I kind of changed here from what you would expect uh, are the generators. Normally you would have expected turbines, right, steam turbines turning great big heavy magnets and making all kinds of power. Uh, I went with thermal generators. Uh, they're new, they're working on it, they're actually setting up some that will replace turbine generators on America's Ohio-class submarines. If you qualify for an Ohio-class submarine, if you qualify for my little saucer here, I, I'm not going to quibble with the Navy. So we went with thermal generators. On the far wall there, you see the controls for the operation. You'll see the uh, gates that we had talked about earlier. It's all here and can be reproduced or modified here. As we come down the ladder to the lower portion of the fusion system, the first thing we're going to look at are the laser firing systems. Now, the laser firing systems are critical to fusion in that they generate the initial heat necessary to start fusion. Once that level is hit, they turn off. They're not needed anymore. Theoretically, they never come on again. They're off forever, but if you need them again, you can simply charge them up and fire them again. The next thing I'd like you to notice are the uh, red and blue pipes first coming off of the fusion reactor into a heat modifier. That is, it's going to make sure that the heat that leaves that container is consistent for running the thermal generators. Then you'll see two sets of pipe. A red set, hot, going out, blue, cooler, coming back in. And that's how the uh, thermal system works. Next are the two black boxes, transformers, very large transformers. These take the energy from the thermal generators, and here they're jumping the power way up, and they're sending it down to the engines, right? And that's their purpose in life. Otherwise, it's relatively small current going to the rest of the ship. Then behind the transformers, you'll notice the big, great big copper tank. That's where we're storing water, right, uh, which is our fuel for the <coughs> fusion system. And then as we swing back around, you'll notice the control panel, once again, exactly like the one upstairs. Uh, used to monitor the system, make modifications to the system. This is the Ox Pilot area, and on the right-hand side here is what I call Newer Station 1. 
and New Earth Station 1 basically monitors the planet. It monitors it for weather conditions, seismic conditions, uh, near-Earth orbit uh, objects that may come in uh, range. Um, this station, of course, is augmented with the pod who will place planetary sensors uh, in positions around us and then low-orbit satellites to assist us. This is the Ox Pilot Control Area, and the purpose of this is to allow for minor movements of the ship. That is, you've landed, you don't quite like where you are, you want to move it 100 yards in either direction. The forward-facing window here actually faces more down than it does forward. It gives you a good look at the terrain where you're about to place the ship. There's no high-speed flying here, just minor movements. And on the third wall here is the uh, information you would need to fly the ship anywhere. Uh, short distance or long, you have to make sure that the reactor, the power control and everything like that is all set up so that you can move the ship. This is what I call the research lab and here organic and inorganic material are introduced to a series of tests to see how they're going to uh, interact with, with human beings, the plants they're going to put uh, into the ground, things like that. And those tests can be done here safely and under controls. The green door back there is basically access to one of the three bedrooms. Here's the galley, probably the happiest place on this ship. We've got a table for six, everybody can sit down together. In the early stages of their journey after they've landed, probably most of the food will be synthetic, brought up from uh, containers uh, within the hull just below here. As time goes on, they will grow their own food and they will process it, and it'll probably become much better. And a short walk down the hall and we come into the medical center. Uh, I consider this very crucial to any ship going out of town. Um, we got two permanent beds, one operating table, one examination table. Uh, just to the right of the examination table as you're sitting in the chair are the diagnostics that can be run on the patient. They have a history of every person on board. Variations uh, in their current status would tell them uh, what's wrong with them back wall contains all of the uh, dry goods, sheets, linens, towels, pillows, tongue depressors, whatever. On the forward wall there you'll see the uh, chrome uh, stainless steel uh, cabinets. That's all of the refrigerated, whole blood taken before they left, things like that. Uh, serums for all kinds of medications that might be, you know, you don't know, right? What worked on chicken pox here might work on something else there. replicator room is where parts are made when either none were brought or the number of parts that were brought have all broken or failed and need to be reproduced. The first unit here is a scanner. You'll place the part here if it doesn't exist in the computer and you'll scan it into the machine. All parts are restricted to four feet across. The next two units are the actual replicator units. Here, the actual component parts are made from the materials that are located up above it. Right? The door will close, the parts will be made. The parts can either be heated for curing or cooled for curing. In either case, the parts come out at an optimum strength or flexibility depending on what's needed. In any case, four foot restriction. If it's greater than four foot, a sum assembly may be required. The next large box is called the shredder. That is, you have something out in the field, it broke, you don't want to go out and uh, use existing materials. You take your component part, you throw it into the shredder, he grinds it up, the raw material is saved, and when you go to build the next one, you take it from the original one. Also, if you do mining, and the actual material can be brought here, it can be shredded and put into the bins up above for storage and use later. On the wall here we have safety goggles, gloves, and ear protection. The control panel here is actually um, for how the unit was intended. That is, you dial up the part that you want, you bring together uh, the size, shape, or any modifications you may need, and then you have the reproducer uh, printed for you.
Okay, this is the last big room we're going to look at, and this is generally called the chariot room, and it's called that because this is where the chariot is held during the flight to the new home. Once you get there, the ramp drops down, and the thing powers itself out. Now, as you're looking at it here, it has three big packages on the top. Those are all the component parts it takes to finish assembling it. You have the bottom tractor, the batteries, the driver's seat, the steering, everything like that, but to drop it down, take it out, and then assemble it. Once that is done, this becomes the general access in and out of the ship. It's a nice, wide ramp, everything like that. In fact, you partially close it because you don't need anything that big. You just drop a door down, you can lift it up, put it down. This becomes the machine shop. There is no hardware store around. If you got something broken, if it's just broken and you don't want to create a whole new one in the replicator room, you bring it into here and you work on it. Many of the products you create in the 3D replicator room are going to have to be brought here and finished. I show this room with all the packaging. You can see piping in the back. There's actually netting, other things. But this is what, um, you know, you got to bring this along, right, to make this kind of stuff work. You're all alone. Okay, let's venture across the floor one last time over to the uh, Ox Pilot area. Here you're going to key in a security code to open up access to the engine compartment. Down here below the living quarters is the propulsion system of the saucer. It is magnetic. It is composed of two circular rings, right, of high speed moving fluids, right, that are highly magnetic, create the propulsion for the ship in the anti gravity or magnetic field it takes to fly it at top speed and to land it on a planet. The actual amount of space is just shy of seven feet. You're looking at almost seven feet. But that's from the bottom of the saucer engine compartment to the lower living area. The lower living area isn't flush to the engine. It's slightly raised so that you get more living space. Okay, but this is the engine. I'm really quite proud of it. It shows all kinds of coils and everything like that. Right? You got the magnetic um, pushers which push the fluid around. Right? Both the outer and inner ring. You have cooling systems. You see the blue containers there. Uh, they're the cooling system. Otherwise, I would imagine it just gets tremendously hot. And what I've read about the magnetic systems that they're looking at now, uh, the ones being done by NASA, there is a heating problem near the core of the magnets. Uh, it's something we might want to consider, and I did here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the tour. I hope you enjoyed the artwork. Any comments, let me know.